Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this live streamed astronomy presentation, The Night Sky in November, with Laura Marseglia and Star Woods. I'm Rick Wallace with the Parido Environmental Education Center, or PEAK, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and I will be the moderator for today's talk. Uh, we are able to offer programming at this time because of our wonderful members and donors, so we'd like to thank you for your continuing support. Laura is currently a student at Northern New Mexico College and will receive her degree in radiation protection next spring. She discovered her interest in astronomy at the Frosty Drew Observatory in Rhode Island and aspires to share her fascination with the cosmos as much as possible. Star Woods is a park guide at the Valles Caldera National Preserve and the lead astronomy ranger there. She just submitted the International Dark Sky application for the preserve. Okay, I guess that's it. Let me turn it over to you folks and you can start your presentation. Good evening and thanks for tuning in. Um, let me advance here. So today I will be talking about uh, what you can see in the night sky uh, in November of this month. Uh, but before I get into that, uh, Star wanted to talk about what the caldera is, uh, how it's functioning um, at this time of year. Uh, and she also had some other things to share as well. So let's start here. Hi, everyone. Um, so like Rick mentioned, I did just submit the International Dark Sky Park application for Valles Caldera National Preserve. So hopefully, um, if you're in Los Alamos, you will have a dark sky park right in your backyard. Um, I should find out in December is when they are going to review my application and let us know. Um, and they being the International Dark Sky Association. And I just wanted to share this website. Uh, thank you, Laura, for screen sharing this. The International Dark Sky Association is actually having a global conference that is free. That's next Friday and Saturday um, throughout I think it's a full 24 hours of different things, but focusing on um, the environmental and cultural threat of artificial light at night, which is what we are all about. Um, and the other thing I wanted to show you is um, the Bias Caldera is part of a night sky consortium in the Jemez Mountains. It's called the Jemez Mountains Night Sky Consortium. Peak is also a part of this. And Galen um, just put out this really great article in the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative. Um, and if you can you scroll down a little bit, it just talks about our efforts um, together. Like I am working on our us being a dark sky park. Bandelier is also working on being a dark sky park. Um, and the consortium. Um, we're working on talking to Los Alamos County to update the lighting ordinance as well as Los Alamos National Laboratory. So it's a really cool effort um, that we're working on. I just want to kind of let people know that's going on. But without further ado, um, if you want either of those links, um, message me at the end and I can give you my email and I will let Laura take it over. Thank you. Cool. So this is just an overview of what else I will be talking about this evening. Uh, so let's dive right in. Um, so first of all, the moon. Uh, the moon is one of the easiest things to see uh, in the night sky. Um, I put here a chart of the phases of the moon, um, what day um, they will be corresponding to each phase and also the time um, that they will be above the horizon. Um, so if we look over here to the left, um, I wrote that the, um, the cycle of the moon, um, say if it starts at full, uh, then it'll go to third quarter, and then here at the bottom, new moon, and then all the way at the left, it'll go back to first quarter. Um, so if we look, um, here I'm using a program called Stellarium, which a lot of you might know about. Um, and if we find the moon, where was that? So it should be, okay. 
should be, let's see here. Ah, I've zoomed out too far. Uh, so it's actually not up right now, but if we advance time, I'm advancing an hour at a time right now. Actually, we'd see it rise in the east, my bad, and there it is. There's the moon. If we zoom in far enough, we can see that it is a uh, third quarter. So there we go. Um, and it rises in the east and sets in the west, uh, just like the sun and also the stars do that as well. Um, some other things I wanted to mention about the moon this month. Um, it is called the full beaver moon, according to the Old Farmer's Almanac. Um, and it's also called the morning moon um, because it is the last full moon before the winter solstice, uh, which I thought was interesting. I didn't know that there are um, so many different names for the moon, depending on the time of year and things like that. So I thought that was cool. Next, uh, I wanted to talk about the lunar eclipse that's happening on at the end of November. Um, it's a penumbral lunar eclipse, so which means that it won't be turning red. It's kind of like a partial eclipse. Um, this is a image, an image that I found uh, that describes uh, what we'll be seeing. So the moon will just look darker compared to a normal full moon. It'll look a little bit dimmer than normal. Um, but other than that, there isn't going to be much else to see. Um, so I wanted to show how a lunar eclipse works. Um, so the moon, at looking at the bottom graphic here, the moon can go behind the earth and if it lines up just right it can get into earth's dark shadow the umbra um, but if it only lines up like almost perfectly then it'll just be in the penumbra so that's why it looks it'll look dimmer uh, because it'll be in part of earth's shadow um, and the reason why um, a total lunar eclipse would appear red is because the sunlight has to go through Earth's atmosphere. Um, so just like sunsets look orangish red, that's it's the same reason um, why the moon would look red is because of the atmosphere and how light kind of interacts in Earth's atmosphere. Um, so the other reason why we don't get lunar eclipses every month or every full moon rather is because the moon's orbit is tilted a little bit off from the uh orbital plane so if like the earth's orbit around the sun were perfectly flat um the moon's orbit would be just slightly off a little bit um so that's why only certain times are good for when um, the moon as a full moon crosses the Earth's shadow. Um, so November 30th, um, it'll be, the moon will be in most of the Earth's shadow at 2.30 in the morning. Um, and again, it'll just look a bit dimmer than normal. So um, you won't really be missing much if you don't catch it. <laughs> So the other couple of things I wanted to talk about are um, conjunctions. These are when two objects appear close together in the sky, even though they aren't actually close together in space. Um, so I have, so first of all, um, let's go over to Solarium. Um, so on November 12th, um, Venus and the crescent moon, that will be, where's Venus though? Oh, in the morning, shoot. Advance time a little bit here and look at Western horizon. 
Where did the moon go? Do I have the wrong day? Yes, I do. There we go. There's Venus. Oops, sorry. So, this is in the southeastern sky. Uh, we have the moon, we have Venus, and actually Mercury here, although that'll be very hard to see as the sun starts to come up. You see there, it'll be just above the horizon, and as time goes on, um, the sun will come up and probably drown out the light from Mercury. So you'll have to time it just right in order to see those. Um, and then, oh, that's why I was advancing the month. So let me go, there we go. That's what I wanted to have happen. So the 11th of November, this, the moon will be much closer to Venus and Mercury in the sky. And then if we go to the 13th, the moon will actually appear to be in between um, Mercury and Venus, which I think will look really, really cool. Um, and if we zoom in here on the moon, uh, we can see that the moon is just a crescent. You can see that it's almost going to be a new moon here. Uh, so that's going to look awesome. I think you just got to wake up early enough to see it. Okay, what else we... And then on November 15th, so let's go back to nighttime. That's at 8 p.m. And then on the 15th, let's find Mars. There we go. Um, so Mars will be ending its retrograde. So let me go back to the presentation here because I found an awesome graphic that shows why Mars or any other planet really would appear to be in retrograde. So um, Mars was in retrograde from September 9th of 2020 and it'll end um, on November 15th. Sorry, that's a typo, um, not the 13th. So, and then this is why Mars appears to be in retrograde is because the Earth is traveling quicker in its orbit than Mars is. And it looks like the Earth is kind of overtaking Mars here. Um, and so this is um, kind of a top down view at the bottom of the graphic um, of the solar system. And then up top is what you would see is the path of Mars in the night sky there in red. So if I actually, if we want to go back to, oops, to September, let's advance time a little bit. And then if I scroll through the days here, you can see that it's going one way in the sky. And now here's the turning point. And then it starts going the other way relative to the background stars, which I think is really cool. So let's go back to November. So yeah, as I said, the turning point will be March 15th. Um, what else do we have? On the 19th, um, we have Jupiter, Saturn, and the moon all looking close together in the sky. That should be in the west, roughly, I think. Let's find Jupiter. Back in time. Oh, there we go. So this will be actually really early uh, at night. So this is 6 p.m. Um, and so you can see the moon, Saturn, and Jupiter all really close together, which is going to look great. And then the last conjunction that I wanted to highlight is on the 25th of November, uh, Mars and the moon will be close together. Look at that. That looks awesome. <clears throat> So that is all the conjunctions I wanted to highlight. So moving on, uh, the constellations um, I wanted to highlight. So this, I, I forgot to mention it earlier. So I am using a program called Stellarium. Uh, you can download it for yourself by going to stellarium.org. They have options for Linux, Microsoft, and um, Macs, uh, which, which is nice. Um, and I just wanted to show you the logo here, um, so you know what you're looking at. Um, so, um, and I'm using this as the kind of virtual planetarium. Um, it's also great for stargazing. 
So let's head over. Oops, there we go. Um, so I wanted to mention the some more obscure constellations, and then I'm going to turn it over to Star to talk about the mythology behind um, some of the other constellations in the sky that are more prominent. So let's find Hydra. Should be... I've lost it. Hmm. Where'd it go? Aha, it's below the horizon. So if we advance time, there we go. So Hydra is, um, what is she? The serpent. I've turned on constellation art here. The serpent, um, and it's a long one. Uh, it's long and skinny, uh, but it goes between um, some other small ones. And it's almost like it's um, chasing the, the twins here. Uh, but more on that in a minute. I also wanted to mention uh, Canis Major, um, which is the large dog. We have Canis Minor here, the small dog. Um, but you can see here uh, the brightest star in the Northern Hemisphere um, that is avail or above the horizon during the winter months. It's called Sirius, also known as the dog star. And the last one I wanted to highlight um, is Pisces. Where's that one? That one is the fish, the two fish that are connected at their tail. Where did that one go? Search for it, Pisces. That one is also below the horizon. Oops, so let's we go back in time. And we go back. There we go. So Pisces is in the western sky and it will be setting in the near future by the end of the month. Um, so, no, well, I said that wrong. Sorry. So this is at 9 p.m. And you can see here that it's getting closer to the western horizon as I advance the days here. So um, by December, no, by January, mid-February, it'll probably appear to us to be below the horizon. So now is a great time to get a look at it. Um, the little circleish blobs here at the ends are the two heads of the fish, and then the, the their tails kind of meet together right near where the moon is. So um, I'll turn it over to Star here, and I'll show the other uh, constellations as they come up. Um, so Star, take it away. Um, sure, so I'm talking about a handful um, and I'm gonna start with Orion. If you wanna pull that up, Laura. Yes. So Orion is the hunter. This goes back thousands of years before the Greeks. Um, there are two myths and several others related, but the main two I'm gonna talk about. Number one, <laughs> so Orion, was a very persistent and unwanted suitor of one of Atlas's daughters, um, Pleiades. Um, due to that, Atlas asked Zeus to transform the sisters, all of his daughters, into stars to keep them safe. Um, so Pleiades is also in the sky. I know you could see it last month. Laura, can you see it this month? You should be able to, let me find it. Oops. Here we go. So they're highlighted here, and this is where Orion is down at the bottom here in the center. So Orion is said to still be pursuing them across the sky. And the other myth is that Orion boasted that he was such a great hunter and could defeat any beast, and the goddess Hera um, calls him on it by sending him a tiny scorpion he ends up crushing the scorpion with his club, but only after it delivered a fatal sting. And both were placed in the sky as a reminder of the cost of arrogance. And then I don't know where the scorpion is though, Laura. Let me find it. It should be close by. It's close uh, by. I don't know if you can see it either this month. I don't actually, I think I said that wrong. Oh, no, wait. 
How? That's not what I wanted to have happen. Uh, score. Sorry. I think that one is more in the summer. I think that was kind of the mythology was why they're on opposite sides of the sky. I think. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we can move on. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, so the next one I wanted to talk about is Auriga. So while she's finding that, um, in classical Greek mythology, Auriga is the charioteer and is usually identified as Erichthonius, son of Hephaestus and Gaia. Hephaestus was the blacksmith of the gods and Gaia was the goddess of the earth. Erichthonius's name means earthborn. Like many Greek characters born from the earth, Erichthonius is associated with serpents and was described as having the body of a serpent from his waist down. When young, Erichthonius imitated the sun god, Helios, by building a chariot and harnessing four horses to it. Zeus marveled at his, this youth's ingenuity and courage and honored him by placing him among the stars. Then the next two I wanna talk about are um, Taurus and Gemini, because they both are very closely related to Zeus. Um, I'll go with Taurus for, oh no, I'll go with Gemini. Gemini's right here. So Gemini means the twins in Latin, representing Castor and Pollux. Um, they were hatched by an egg, laid by Leda, the queen of Sparta, and Zeus, who had transformed into a swan to deceive Leda. So since they have a human mother and a god as a father, Pollux was immortal, but Castor was mortal. Eventually, Castor was killed in battle, and Pollux tells Zeus that he doesn't want to be immortal without his brother. So Zeus permitted his immortality to be shared further between the mortal and the immortal world. And now I'll go to Taurus. So Taurus the bull um, is actually Zeus. He disguised himself as a bull to get close to Europa, who was closely guarded by her father. So while he was disguised as a bull in her father's herds, on her daily walk, she approaches him and ends up climbing onto his back. When she did that, Zeus ran down to the sea and swam over to Crete, and then he revealed his identity to her. She then becomes a, the queen of Crete, and Europe is also named after Europa's namesake. And if you think of the symbol, it's like a circle with the bull horns. It's just representing like the bull's head, like the zodiac symbol, because um, he's swimming through the water. And then the last year also zodiac signs, Leo and Cancer. Find Leo here. Um, sorry, I'm all turned around. Um, <laughs> That's okay. So Leo is from the Babylonian zodiac, and the lion is often engaged in a struggle with a heroic warrior, which is very common in Babylonian artwork. And then the theme continued with the Greeks, who mostly associates the constellation with the Nemean lion that was slain by Hercules. There it is. There we go. So which direction is this, Laura, that we're looking east? Facing east. And I actually, I could have um, gone back a little bit and then advanced the time. There we go. So this is 2.30 in the morning, uh, but here's Leo in November. And then what was the last one? Um, cancer. So right above Leo. Yes, here we go. 
So Cancer <laughs> was a crab that the goddess Hera sent to foil Hercules while he was fighting the Lardian Hydra. Um, he does nip at Hercules' heels, but in battle, Hercules ends up stepping on it and he wins the battle. So Hera placed it in the sky to honor its bravery and loyalty. Cool. And that's the last one I have. Thank you, that was really cool. Yeah, I did wanna show, I'll turn my camera on. Mm -hmm. um, my source, <laughs> um, this is, um, the night sky, a field guide to constellations. Um, so I really like Stellarium, um, but when I'm out there, I like using my field guide as well. It tells me the mythology, it tells me where to look in the sky, um, times of the year, things like that. So if you're more of like a hands-on person, I really like this field guide. Cool, thank you. Okay, so that was uh, all the constellations I wanted to mention. Oh, I forgot about uh, mentioning Ursa Major. Uh, so Ursa Major is the big bear. Um, and you can see here that it's actually also the Big Dipper. If I zoom in a bit here, that'll start to look familiar. Um, now the coolest thing, well, so there are two cool things about Ursa Major. One, is that it is circumpolar. So that means that over the course of the whole year, um, it will appear to be above the horizon. Um, so it won't ever um, go below the horizon, which I find fascinating, just because it's so close to the North Star. Now to find the North Star, you take the two stars that are farthest away from the handle and then you go about four or five times between the two stars, that length, about four or five times up, and you get to uh, Polaris, the North Star. This is the star that is closest to the Earth's axis, uh, the, north, the northern axis which I think is cool. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention about Ursa Major is that the Big Dipper is actually what's called an asterism. So an asterism is something that is a group of stars, but isn't a constellation. Another example of an asterism would be the Summer Triangle, which has stars from three different constellations. So yeah. All right. What else did I want to talk about tonight? Yes, things you can see with binoculars or a telescope um, in the sky. Um, so let's switch back over to Stellarium. Um, so M2, oh, it's below the horizon. It has already set. So this one is kind of on its way out. Uh, but it's still a fun one. Uh, so M2 is um, named in a catalog. This catalog was created by Charles Messier, which is where the M comes from. Um, he was an astronomer in the 17 or 1800s, somewhere in there, and he was looking for comets. Um, in his search um, he used his telescope, which telescope technology wasn't fantastic back then, so he could only really tell if something was a star or a fuzzy blob. So he cataloged a lot of these fuzzy blobs in the hopes that one of them would turn out to be a comet. He made a catalog of about 120 objects, and he never um, did None, none of those turned out to be a comet. Um, so that's where the classification comes from. So 
This is a globular cluster. It can have on the order of hundreds of thousands of stars. They are on the older side, as stars go, um, about the age of the sun. Um, so this will, if you look at it with a telescope, it'll look like a cotton ball, but it's fascinating to me that there can be hundreds of thousands of stars in these clusters. Um, and they can be light years across. They're, these are massive structures. Um, so it's, I think they're fascinating. Um, the, another gl uh, globular cluster that I wanted to mention is in the constellation Perseus. So let me find that. Um, here we go. And then, nope, deep sky objects. Here we go, the Perseus double cluster. So th these are, this is a fantastic candidate to look at with binoculars. These are both globular clusters uh, that have stars within them. Um, and then these two clusters also are gravitationally bound to each other, um, which is how they stay together in the night sky. So these are just outside the constellation Perseus, uh, which is where they get their name. They are kind of, What's the anatomy of Perseus here? Oh, right at Perseus's head. There you go. Cool. Um, and as Star mentioned, um, which I'm going to find again, we have the Pleiades. That was over, where was that? Oh, it's so hard to find your bearings on a screen. Apologies, there we go, I went right past it. So the Pleiades is another kind of star cluster. Um, it's called an open star cluster. Um, this is a type of cluster that has on the order of hundreds, maybe thousands of stars. Um, these are more loosely bound and they're smaller in, in size as well, like diameter, so to say. The, um, the interesting thing with the Pleiades is that you can, um, with a really good telescope or like this is um, uh, a photo taken, uh, you can see the leftover gas. So this could, this probably was a star forming region at some point, um, but has since, um, the gas has since left the region and now all we're left with are the stars. Um, so the history behind the Pleiades, I think, is really cool. What else did I want to point out? Let's turn these back on. Yes, the Andromeda galaxy. So this is a galaxy that you can see um, with a good telescope. If you are in a dark enough sky, such as at the caldera, <laughs> you can see this with the naked eye. It'll look like a really faint smudge in the sky with your naked eye. Um, but when you look at it with binoculars or a telescope, you can see the oval, sh oval shape. Um, you can see the couple of satellite galaxies here, um, the M32 here on the right and M110 on the left. These are, these are satellite galaxies of Andromeda. So Andromeda is the Milky Way's closest neighbor. And I think it's about 7 billion years from now um, that the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way galaxy uh, will collide. Unfortunately, we're gonna miss that. That's gonna be fantastic to see. Um, so these are more um, fuzzy things that uh, Charles Messier put into his catalog and the Andromeda galaxy is M31 and then M32 and M110 are its satellite galaxies. Um, an interesting thing about the history of astronomy is that um, back in the time of Charles Messier, um, they didn't know that galaxies were distinct from nebulas. So nebulas are clouds of gas and dust um, that exist well, in every galaxy, but the um, nebulas that we can see are in our own galaxy, whereas 
for example, Andromeda, it was initially called the Andromeda Nebula, but now we know that Andromeda is its own galaxy, separate from the Milky Way. Um, another galaxy I wanted to highlight is the Triangulum Galaxy, also known as M33. It is right nearby um, on the other side of the constellation Andromeda, also right near the one of the heads of Pisces. If I zoom in here, let's turn these off. We can see that um, this is this galaxy is oriented to us differently. So you can see that um, it's more head on, whereas the Andromeda galaxy was kind of like in between being on its side and being head on. So this one is really cool because in a telescope, you can tell that the, it has the spiral arms here, just like the Milky Way has. Um, and that looks great in uh, a telescope. Now, speaking of nebulas, going back to that a little bit, um, there is a fantastic one in Orion. Um, so if I advance time here, so we are now at um, the 21st of November at midnight here. It's a decently high up above the sky in the southeast. Um, and so to do the anatomy of Orion again, we have his two um, shoulders here, Betelgeuse and what's the other one called? Bellatrix. Um, his two feet are called Rigel and Scythe. Um, we have the three um, stars in Orion's belt. Um, his bow, like Archer's bow, is out here to the right, and his club, I think, or his sword um, is back up to, yeah, his club um, is back up to the left. So if we look kind of going down from Orion's belt, so like, like literally down towards the horizon, if we look that way relative to his belt, now you do need a relatively dark sky for this as well. You can see in Orion's uh, like sword or dagger um, that this beautiful nebula um, is here. This, there are three parts to this nebula. The red part here down the bottom is an emission nebula, which is when the light from the stars interacts with the gas of the nebula, excites the atoms, and then as the atoms de-excite, they, uh, they release photons or particles of light. Now, because the um, most of the gas in the nebula is hydrogen, that dictates, the, the element, in this case hydrogen, dictates the color of light that will be emitted. Um, up here at the top, this blue portion of the nebula is called a reflection nebula. That's when the light from the stars isn't enough to um, excite the gas particles. Instead, the light from the stars is just reflected off of the gas. And then in between here, we have this really dark patch um, that is called an absorption nebula. That is when the gas is so dense, and it probably also has a little bit of dust in there, um, and it blocks the light from behind it. So there are stars behind this part of the nebula. We just can't see it because the gas in front is so dense. So this is fantastic with binoculars. It's actually very large and hard to fit into um, some more high powered telescopes, but this one is fantastic to look at. You can see a lot of detail with it. It's really bright. Um, and of course, um, if you go to um, a place with really dark skies, you can see this naked eye. I've been able to see it a couple of times. Um, I haven't gone myself, but I imagine at the caldera, you'd be able to see this really well. So this is in um, the southeastern sky, as is all of Orion. What other things did I want to mention? Oh, binary stars. Yes, so Mizar and Alcor. Yes, so that would be in Ursa Major. 
Let me find my czar to make sure I'm talking about the right one. Yes, so let me advance time just so it's a little higher. So we have the Big Dipper here. We have the four stars in the handle up top, or rather the four stars in the cup, excuse me, up top, and then down below the three stars in the handle. So if we look at the middle star in the handle, uh, and if we zoom in, it should show us, yeah, that there are three, uh, well, so two stars, uh, Mizar and Alcor, and there's actually a third star in this system. So, uh, but we mostly just re refer to it, excuse me, as Mizar and Alcor. Um, so these, so binary stars are stars that are gravitationally bound um, and orbit around each other, basically. Uh, more precisely, they orbit around um, a center of gravity that's in the middle of these two stars. Um, and so the cool thing about Mizar Elcor is this third star that's in this kind of group. There are all three of these are gravitationally bound together. Um, and then I think if I'm remembering right, you won't be able to see it um, in Stellarium, but if I'm remembering right, each of these three stars is its own binary pair. So in this case, we think that um, some of, or one or more of the stars in Mizar Al Alcor um, are what's called a false binary system, um, which means that they just appear really close together in the sky, almost on top of each other at this point, <laughs> um, but they're not actually close to each other in space. It's just like a conjunction of planets, for example, um, but they are actually not close together in space because it's very unlikely for six stars to be gravitationally bound to each other. Um, the other one I wanted to mention was Almac, which is, oh, I should have zoomed out for that, but that is in the Andromeda it's in kind of the, the foot region <laughs> of Andromeda. So this one's called Almac. And if I don't think it'll show us if we zoom in. Uh, you, oh, there we go. Look at that. This one um, is good because it's very, you can tell the difference in colors. Uh, obviously here one is blue and one is orange. Um, and it's also easy to find. Um, so this one is kind of the wintertime equivalent of Albireo, which is in the uh, summer sky in the constellation Cygnus, the swan. And this is Almac in Andromeda is the wintertime equivalent. Huh, I think that's cool. You can see here, um, if, you, if you look far enough in, um, that it shows the Andromeda galaxy is a smudge, and over here, the Triangulum galaxy. That'd be really hard to see with the naked eye, because it's so small. <clears throat> Alrighty. So, go back to my presentation. I don't want to miss anything. Meteor shower, yes. So, um, this year, or this month's meteor shower, excuse me, is the Leonids. Um, so, meteor showers are caused by the debris that is left over from a comet as it goes around the sun. So when a comet gets close to the sun, um, the ice and dust start to kind of melt and eventually vaporize. And so that forms the tail of the comet. And it also leaves debris behind. So when the earth passes through that debris field, that's when we get a meteor shower. So the whole meteor shower will last November 5th through December 3rd, but the peak is Tuesday, November 17th. Uh, you'll get about 20 meteors per hour, um, which is small as, as far as meteor showers go, but um, it's still really, really fun to watch a meteor shower. So the best time to watch the meteor shower will be before dawn on Wednesday. So let me show you here. 
it will be on the 17th, we said. Um, and I want to get it. This will be in the eastern sky because Leo rises in the east at this time of year. And you can see here that Stellarium has marked the radiant point of the meteor shower. So the radiant point um, is where all the meteors appear to be originating from. So if you were to take a time lapse of the sky as um, like the peak of the meteor shower was going on, um, and then looked at where all the meteors seem to be coming from in the sky, um, that point is called the radiant point. So meteor showers are named for their radiant points. And the Leonid meteor shower is in the constellation Leo. Um, there is where it gets its name. Um, for example, the Perseids, which happen in August, are um, in the, their radiant point is in the constellation Perseus. Um, and the Orionids, are their radiant point is in the constellation Orion. Um, we also have a crescent moon um, right around this time. If I advance time a little bit, we should see the moon. No, let me go back. I want to make sure I'm getting that right. First quarter. Okay, yes, yeah, so we do have a crescent moon. Um, remember the peak of the meteor shower is November 17th. Um, so we're right between new moon and first quarter. So that'll be fantastic to get um, dark skies for the meteor shower. Now, was there anything I missed that I wanted to say about the meteor shower? Yeah, so um, I would watch the meteor shower before dawn on Wednesday because that is when the radiant point is above the horizon. Okay, <clears throat> now, if you are interested in getting involved in astronomy, but really don't know where to start, um, I've been there and I've picked up some tips along the way. Uh, one fantastic thing to use, um, it's kind of smaller than a whole field guide. So if maybe, maybe you might feel um, kind of daunted flipping through a field guide book during the middle of the night. Uh, but this is kind of a good thing. Um, it's called a planisphere, and it's good to get you used to um, finding constellations in the night sky. So the planisphere is two layers. Um, one, the bottom layer has all the constellations in the sky that you can see in the summer, winter, every season. Um, and then the top layer has this transparent window that only shows you what you'd be looking at. Um, during the time of night, which you can see here, like um, on the inside of this ring here, um, it and then it shows you the day that you'd be looking. So it has the months and then has the days on top as well. So if you line those two up, you'll be able to tell what you're looking at, um, what constellations would be visible when you go outside. Another thing I suggest doing is uh, either making or getting a red flashlight. Now, the reason you'd want a red flashlight is that your pupils tend to dilate when they're exposed to bright light. Um, so white light is all the colors, red light is just filtered out and your eyes are less sensitive to red light. So they'll, they'll kind of contract, your pupils will contract less when you're using the flashlight and that can enable you to um, keep your pupils dilated so it'll take less time to look from your planisphere to finding things that are dim in the sky. And then I have um, some specifications here about where to start um, with finding binoculars or telescopes. These are just kind of starter telescopes uh, that'll help you get started. Um, and once you have the hang of that, you can kind of scale up a little bit. And so Star, you wanted to mention um, that you have some of this gear um, at the Caldera, right? 
Yeah, um, so we are open 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and the building isn't open, but Rangers are there and we can sell you things out of our bookstore. And we do have a planisphere. We have um, the field guide and the field guide comes with a flashlight in the back, a red flashlight. Um, and like some other astronomy things, and we don't have a telescope or any other red flashlights. Um, but yeah, come and see me. I'm there Saturday through Wednesday. Awesome, thank you. So that's all I have. Uh, thank you guys very much for listening. And at this point, I will definitely take any questions that you guys might have. Great, thank you, Laura. And thank you to Star as well. Um, for those who might be interested, the Peak Store is uh, open. Uh, if you, uh, I, I believe there's a website you can get to through the, the peak, uh, normal peak uh, nature.org website, and they have a few things for sale. Uh, they also, I believe, sell the planispheres that they used to, and they have some little small red flashlights. So that's another source for those. And you can uh, order those and then drive by and pick them up uh, at a designated time. Um, okay, so questions. The uh, first question we have, <clears throat> is back on the sun earth moon diagram laura that you had at mm -hmm. the very beginning um someone says uh, they think the angles are exaggerated correct yes so the sun is much farther away uh from the earth and moon than is shown here um also the sizes of everything is uh put much bigger as well um just for the sake of having a good diagram uh, but in reality everything is much smaller and much farther apart as well okay great <clears throat> I, those are all the questions that i have if anyone else has questions you can type them into the chat um otherwise i don't see a lot of other questions um <clears throat> Let's see, you mentioned that, uh, I'll just throw one out. You mentioned that the um, uh, meteor shower was easiest to see um, right before dawn or at least after midnight. <clears throat> Can you talk a little bit about why that is? Yes, so let me go back actually here to, oops, to Stellarium. So it's easiest to see before dawn because the radiant point is above the horizon. So if I move time backward from, this is 5 a.m. now, almost six, two, four, three, two. So as we get kind of earlier into the night, you'll see that um, the radiant point here, which is shown in yellow, is getting closer to the horizon and at 10 p.m. is below the horizon. So you want the radiant point to be above the horizon because maybe some of the meteors that are kind of going from the radiant point and going down toward the horizon from our perspective. You wouldn't be able to see those if the radiant point was below the horizon. So that's why it's best to wait um, or maybe wake up really early that day um, and try and look while um, the radiant point is above the horizon, which for this meteor shower happens to be in the morning before dawn. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'll mention that for meteor showers in general, um, <clears throat> even when the radiant is visible in the evening, it's usually best to look at them after midnight because if you think about it, the Earth's rotation is such that the Earth is rotating into the meteor shower after midnight and uh, in its path through the sky, through around the sun. Um, and so you should uh, see a larger number of meteors in the second half of the night. So that's always a good, a good tip for looking at meteor showers. Um, okay, yeah. I'm not seeing any other questions, so I guess that's it. Um, that Laura and Star, thank you so much again for sharing with us tonight, and thanks again for tuning in. Good night, everybody. Thank you.